to welcome you this morning to Community Evangelical Church. We're glad you're here, glad you've chosen to come and worship with us this morning. Uh, we'd like to um, wish uh, all of our moms a very special Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for all you do and for who you are, and uh, we're just um, glad to have you here with us, and we celebrate you today as well. Uh, as we begin our worship service uh, this morning, I want to invite you to fill out that connection card that's in your bulletin. Uh, again, it looks a little different than uh, it usually does uh, because um, on the back is uh, information about the Go Be the Church Sunday. And we'll be talking about this each Sunday uh, as we come up to June 9th, uh, looking for uh, individuals who will be willing to serve in different areas. Uh, there are places on the back for you to indicate where you would like to go to serve. Again, we've encouraged um, life groups to work together on this as well. Uh, I know um, one of our life groups is working on uh, being involved at the Hope Rescue Mission and doing the worship service there. And so there's so many different opportunities. Uh, I know we do need extra people. We need a huge group of people to help out with the biker blessing, uh, both in the morning setting up. And in the afternoon, uh, running all of the things there at Classic Harley-Davidson. So if you'd be willing to help out with the biker blessing specifically, uh, on the Welcome Center, there is a place to uh, sign up for the different responsibilities there. So please take time to fill that out and, and sign up for those things. Uh, T-shirt sizes are uh, important because we need to order T-shirts. So if you are helping us out, if you're serving somewhere, uh, one of those opportunities, let us know, and we will order you a t-shirt. I um, also want to encourage you to use uh, this card to share with us um, any prayer requests, any questions you may have, any uh, information you'd like to share with the staff. We love to pray through those prayer requests on a regular basis uh, every Monday morning. A um, couple of other things that are happening that we want to make you aware of. Uh, first of all, next Sunday at 11 o'clock, there is a uh, VBS uh, volunteer meeting. Uh, that's for all, all the people who are volunteering for VBS. Uh, so we're looking for individuals who would like to come and just minister in the lives of kids. So if you're interested, uh, that meeting will happen at 11 o'clock. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby as well because there will be a lunch included in that. So we'd encourage you to take, uh, take the opportunity to sign up to be a part of that uh, June 2nd, we have a baptism service, which is very exciting. We have a, a, a few people who have signed up to be baptized, uh, believers' baptism. And uh, if you uh, have not been baptized and you would like to make that public declaration of your desire to be a follower of Jesus, I would encourage you to sign up uh, and be a part of that service. Um, if you have a graduate this year in your family, high school, college, uh, or postgraduate uh, education. Uh, we would love to learn about them so we can honor them. Uh, there's some forms in the lobby you can fill out that, will, that you can share with us uh, any uh, information about them. We, we hope to get all of the, that information back to us by June 2nd so that we can get that together. Um, th as you, uh, if, if some of you here this morning may have the special gift of playing the drums. Um, we, for our worship team, we are looking for some drummers. So if you play the drums, uh, that may be some of you in this room. I don't know, maybe. Um, uh, we have two of our drummers are going off to college in the fall. And so uh, we're looking for some people to play the drums. I, I, I'm reading a book right now about worship, and it's amazing the number of scriptures that deal with using instruments, percussion instruments in worship. And so I know sometimes we're like, oh, they're so loud. It's biblical. So if you play the drums, we'd love to have you as part of the worship team. Um, and we're uh, also looking for um, people who would be interested in helping out uh, with our um, children's ministry this summer. Um, we, we are going to a summer schedule and really, this is for all of us. We're going to a summer schedule this summer. So this is probably new information because I don't think we've announced this yet anywhere. Um, no. So here's, here's our plan for the summer. Uh, in order to, um, last year we went to a summer schedule where we had went down to two services. 
Um, we are going to do that again this summer. We're going to do that in conjunction with our children's ministry. And so that will start on June 16th. That's the weekend or the week after the Go Be the Church Sunday. When we come back, uh, we will go to a summer schedule. The, what that summer schedule will look like, um, last year we kind of felt like uh, when we eliminated the 11 o'clock service, uh, we said to a portion of our congregation, we're just cutting you out. And so what we've done is we've changed the times of all of our services so that nobody feels cut out. We kind of are combining things. So starting on June 16th uh, through um, the middle of August, our services will be at 830. So this service will actually start a half hour later. So we'll start at 830. You get to sleep in a little bit for the summer. And then tenants, we got an amen. Thank you. We're a little concerned about that, so good. So we got an amen, so at least one person's in favor of that. So this service will start at 8.30, and then uh, the contemporary service will start at 10 o'clock. Um, during the 10 o'clock hour, we will have our children and youth ministries. Now, our teachers, who teach all year long, uh, will be on a rotating basis, but we would like to give them as much of a break as possible So we're looking for additional people who will help out So if you're available if you'd be willing to help out with children's ministry just for the summer To take one or two Sundays. You don't have to do every Sunday. Could you just uh, indicate that on the card as well? And uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby if that's easier for you or you can go right to Corinne Mast And she will tell you how to do that so we have gathered together this morning for worship, and I'd like to read to you from uh, Psalm 8, and please allow, um, just, just sit for a moment and allow the words of Scripture to just kind of wash over you this morning. The psalmist says this, O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength. Silence your enemies, all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky, I see the works of your fingers, the moon, the stars you set in place. What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Let's pray together. Father, this morning we have gathered to enter into your presence. We have come together to worship you and we want to recognize your greatness. We want to, we want to surrender to your glory. God, we have gathered this morning to bring glory to your name and to lift you high. And so we invite you into this place. We know that you are here, but we ask, oh God, that you would move in our presence and that you would be glorified. We want to experience you today. And we want you, oh God, to feel and to experience the worship that we give to you. So from the depths of our hearts, with all that we are, we have come to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> Happy Mother's Day to all our mothers this morning. A little bit of history about our first hymn. It's titled Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. It's on page 30 of the hymnal. British hymnologist Eric Routley calls this hymn full of plump polysyllables. Another scholar called it a flowery attempt to express the, the inexpressible. The hymn was inspired by the Apostle Paul's words to young Timothy, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever, and ever. The writer of the hymn, Walter Chalmers Smith, was a pastor in the Free Church of Scotland for 44 years. Though he wrote many hymns, this is the only one still in use today. 
In our day of casual Christianity and almost flippant prayer, we desperately need to catch glimpses of God's incredible character. In these wonderful stanzas, we who wither and perish come face to face with our immortal, invisible, unchanging God, and amazingly, this great God, whom even polysyllables can't describe adequately, loves us so very dearly. Let's think about that as we sing these verses. I'll invite you to stand to sing, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number 30 in the hymnal. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. 
Rather bring them up with dis dis discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Thank you, young lady. I think our attention to the scripture was piqued as she spoke those words to us. So thank you and do that again sometime. Our prayer hymn is Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart, 182 in the hymn book. And the author was thinking about his need to have the Lord come and dwell in him. Number 182, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart.
Will you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us here together as the family of God. Today, as we celebrate family and children and parenting and motherhood, we are grateful, God, that you have blessed us in such a way to have this great relationship with one another. God, we bless you because you are good. We love you because you first loved us. God, as we seek you, we know that your promise is there, that we will find you. So God, may we never grow weary of seeking after you, of seeking your heart, of understanding your ways better, of knowing you more intimately and more deeply. Reveal to us your character. And God, help us to see how beautiful Jesus is. Father, we want to lift up some things today that are heavy on our hearts. We think about um, Andrew Forbes, who had a wrist surgery again this week. We just ask, oh God, that you will heal him completely. Thank you that they didn't have to do the, the graft that they thought they might have to. But we look forward to seeing what you're going to do with this situation. Help him to be encouraged, God, and be patient and be faithful. We also ask, Father, for Jeannie Gus to continue her healing process. Thank you, God, that there is nothing wrong with her heart. But we do pray that she will rest in your arms as she awaits um, the surgery she's going to have on her atal hernia. Encourage her, God. May, they know, may she know that she is loved. Father, we want to pray for um, one of my family members, one of our cousins, Bunky, who has cancer all through her body and is having surgery this week. We just ask, God, that you will bring your cleansing power into her life and into her body that you will remove this cancer from her, that she will keep her eyes on you, that you will increase her faith. Surround her family, God, with prayers of deliverance and with encouragement in the coming days. Lord, we also want to give you praise for, first of all, for Shelly Kelly's new grandson, who arrived a little early this week, but all in your timing. Thank you that he's doing well. We thank you that her daughter-in-law blood pressure has come down and she's doing better also. But we look forward to what you have in store for this child. You brought him into this world a little early and now you're going to use him, Father, in wonderful ways. Strengthen him each day. And again, we just thank you for the joy of this new child. We also want to praise you, God, for Brendan Weaver's friend, Alan, who came to faith last night. And he too needs our prayers, God. First of all, that he will understand even more clearly your heart for him. I pray, God, that someone will come to his life who will be able to disciple him and walk alongside of him, Father. We also know he needs prayer for healing for stage four liver cancer. So surround him, God, with your goodness, surround him with your people, surround him with prayers. May he know that he is loved. God, we look forward to hearing from your word today. Thank you for sharing this word, preserving this word for us through the centuries. We love you, God. We bless you. Have your way in us today, we pray. Amen.
Did you do your homework? We will, uh... In a minute. Now, get off your devices. You heard your mother get off your devices. Ugh, fine. Hey, if I have to get off my... I didn't have to save get off my yours. game yet. You go. You go. You go do your homework. I'm, gonna do I'm my trying homework. to do my homework. You're in my, You're in my way. You're, You're in my I'm way. I'm going to be first. I'm going to no, be first. Oh. He got in front of me. Stop <sighs> arguing and do your homework. It's my do, space. Do, do your homework. This is my elbow area. This is my space over here. I'm going to get I'm done gonna, first. I'm no, I'm going to get done first. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done too. Good. Now go get ready for bed. <sighs> Already? Come on. Uh, Oh. Uh, fine. It makes you so oh. tired. Oh, go ahead. Why are kids so exhausting? Are they old? Are they old enough for college yet? I don't get you. Hey, no tag back. Tickle my, tickle no, I'm not. Are you getting ready for bed? Get stop, ready for stop bed. Me. I don't want to be tickled. I'm gonna get ready for bed. You better get ready for bed. Did you, did what? you take it? I didn't take anything. Mom, I, I can't find fluffy sparkle wings. Did you check under your pillow? No. <laughs> it's okay. And where is Quackers McDuckerson? He's pretty big. Did you look behind you? Oh, Duh. <laughs> You're not on your devices, are you? No. No. Don't make us come up there. They're coming, they're coming. You know? Did you say your prayers? Dear God, thank you for butterflies and rainbows and sunshine and rain, even though we've had way too much. And thank you for all the ice cream in the world that we can't have because our parents are on a diet. <laughs> and thank you for my brother, even though he smells gross. Thank you for my sister, even though she looks gross. Thank you for our, our family. family. Thank you for our family. Amen. A lot of people have said that marriage changes everything and that it's going to be a completely different life. I hate to say it, there's four kids in the middle of this, but this could have been much uglier than it ended up being. Just like anything else, you have to prepare for the unexpected. You have to prepare for life's vicissitudes. The storm clouds on the horizon are rising inflation and the fact that wages still are not keeping pace. I never got married because I live in a country and a culture that allows me to have the choice. And you have to really, really like and respect uh, the person that you're, you're married to. I don't want you! I am very So we continue our series that we've called Family Matters Month as we're talking about the things that make healthy families. And uh, God views us as as uh, individuals, as part of families, but also collectively as his body, we are family. And today we've kind of designated Family Sunday. Um, as you've noticed, uh, we've had some of your young people involved, and uh, we've tried to include all generations in uh, our service and being a part of leading and, and participating. Uh, today we're going to talk about parenting, and specifically, um, what does it look like for us to parent in a godly way? Now, Again, this is a series that we could spend uh, months on, uh, but we're going to try to squeeze it into one Sunday. And so one of the things that uh, we wanted to do today uh, was to bring some parenting experts in to share. Um, 
they wouldn't call themselves parenting experts, but they've done well. Um, and so I've invited uh, Chet and Jan Mosteller to come and share some of their thoughts, having raised two daughters uh, who are both part of our church. And, uh, and uh, so we've just asked them to kind of share some thoughts on parenting from their experience. So uh, I'm going to turn the microphone over. Jan said that may be dangerous, dangerous. but uh, I trust them. And uh, I think if they take the rest of the time, Chet said he wouldn't take more than two hours. So we'll be good. 8.35, <laughs> That's right. You're good. No problem. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, when Jan said that Mike said, uh, would you two speak a little bit about parenting? Just sort of like scratch your head a little bit. We've had different generations. We've had the young, we've had the middle, and I guess we're the old ones, Mike. So thank you. Uh, when, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> when we think about parenting, uh, you think about a lot of things, but you know, we've all heard the expression WWJD, what would Jesus do? How about HWJP? How would Jesus parent? Now, obviously, we didn't have the, the pleasure, the privilege of, of having Jesus as a parent uh, in the traditional sense of the way, in, in that he, he didn't have children. But when you think about that, I wish we would have thought about that when our kids were young because I think it adds a, another dimension. I have two points I want to talk about before I turn it to Jan. And so I'll take the first hour and she'll take the second hour. Uh, <clears throat> Jan and I both grew up in country churches. And while our parents were very different in terms of, of a lot of different things, uh, how, they, how they raised each of Jan and her sister and brother and me and my sister and brothers, there was one thing that was extremely common, and that is we went to church every Sunday. We were part of a church family. From the time we were the smallest to the time you know, we, we got through college. Uh, our churches were, ironically enough, only like three miles apart and we didn't know each other until we were about 14 or 15. And uh, we celebrated our 50th anniversary of being together a long time ago. So anyways, a couple of things in addition to that, that common thread there is the fact that we believe that children and it, when you're parenting, you need to set boundaries. And I think that we all like to know what our boundaries are and believe it or not, our children like to know what the boundaries are also. They may not agree with the boundaries, they may not like the boundaries, but at the end of the day, they like to have boundaries. With boundaries comes discipline. And while discipline sounds like it's uh, not a very good word in today's society, discipline is important. It's how you discipline and how you discipline with love that we think is, is critical in, in, in raising, uh, raising our, our children. Uh, we're very thankful, number one, that God gave us two wonderful girls, two girls that we're extremely proud of, we couldn't be prouder, and in today's world, we get to be grandparents, and that's really a lot of fun, too. So with that, I didn't take my hour. Sorry, Mike, I'll turn it over to Jan. Yeah, you're short of an hour, I'm impressed. <laughs> Um, I, when Chet and I first started talking about this, um, a lot of things that came across were because we were trained as teachers. And once a teacher, always a teacher. And it's in my heart. Um, parenting is a passion of mine because I'm still in the schools and I still see parent, uh, children who are yearning for parents. They're yearning for unconditional love. That means no matter what, no matter what they did that day, no matter what, there's always a second chance because God gave us a second chance. Um, I think the most important thing when I tried to narrow it down was um, give Jesus to your children. That means surround them every opportunity you have 
with people who love the Lord because you're not going to parent alone. You need a village. This church is our village. That means, and this is a shameless plug, a shameless plug for our children's education downstairs. We need people who love the Lord. You may think you are not a teacher, but if you love the Lord, you can share that with a child. And that means surround them with Sunday school teachers, Awana teachers, Bible school teachers, every opportunity you have to put your child in an atmosphere of people who love the Lord. Go to church camp. Our oldest daughter grew tremendously through church camps. So that's giving your children Jesus. Because you're not always going to be with them. They're going to go off. They're going to go to college. They're going to go their own way. They may even live in another state, another country from you. But if you give them Jesus, they will always have a friend. When they think that everything else has failed and they have no friend walking beside them, Jesus will always be walking beside them. And then the second part of that is giving them to Jesus. This was hard for me. When my girls were younger, I thought I could control every situation. I couldn't. Both my girls have chronic diseases, and I faced a wall where I had to give them to Jesus. That means he loved them before I did, before Chet did, and he loved them even better than we did. And so you have to give that control to him. And the third thing is pray, pray, pray. <laughs> I don't consider that I have two children. I have four children and four grandchildren. God gave me two son-in-laws who I consider my sons. And that is because I prayed for them. I prayed for them when my daughters were in high school. <laughs> I prayed that God would give them godly men. And he did. And in return, I got two sons who are godly sons. And so there is never a time that you stop praying for them. You pray for them when they're babies. You pray for them when they're adults. And you pray for them when they're in their own homes with their own children, when being an adult sometimes is not so much fun. <laughs> so I think out of everything, it's probably the prayer. You know, we didn't, Chet and I did not do anything that, all of you haven't done, but we did it with God, which I'm sure all of you are doing too. Awesome. That was so awesome. Thank you, Chet. Thank you. That was perfect. Thank you, so guys. Mike's not going to preach now. Yep. Bro. So <laughs> honestly, though, like Tim, am I wrong? They hit our sermon. So Tim and I are both going to preach this morning, and they just hit it. So um, no, let's pray, and then we are going to dive into the sermon. That was so awesome. I actually didn't know what they were going to say. I was holding my breath when Chet said he was going to take two hours, um, but man, that was so perfect. Let's pray, and uh, let's dive into God's Word a little bit this morning. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open your Word, and um, thank you for Chet and Jan and others who have lived out what godly parenting is. Teach us all to be godly parents whether we are parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles, whether we just have kids in our lives, Father, teach us to be godly for their sake. We love you. Uh, we give this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So um, I have a friend. His name is Oliver, and Oliver and I have been hanging out recently, and we had lunch this week. Oliver has some pretty amazing life stories. I think he's just an awesome guy. Um, he just through his experiences, uh, he was he's, he's talking to me. Just this is just uh, one of the little stories Oliver often tells. He says, you know, he talks about his friend Rob or Bob. Excuse me, he calls him Bob. My friend Bob, who used to be my boss, who we're really close with. He said, you probably know him. <clears throat> and I said, I, I know lots of Bobs. He said, his name's Bob Mueller. And I said, I don't know Bob Mueller. He said, oh, you probably know him as Robert Mueller. So, so this is Oliver. He's had these incredible life experiences. He was a vice president of the Ford Motor Company, worked for uh, CarTech and, and all these things. And, and so I've been just 
really developing a neat friendship with Oliver. And he said to me, so what are you talking about on Sunday? And I said, parenting. And he said, listen, this is what, this is what you have to remember when it comes to parenting. He said, parenting is probably the most important job in the world. But it's the job that comes with the least amount of training. We just throw you into it and say, figure it out. He said, so always remember that no parent comes in as an expert. And some pick it up quicker than others, but every parent needs grace because it's such a hard job. And so there are so many things we could talk about when we talk about parenting and as we, as we go through this. But much like we did last week, I, I kind of wanted to heed Oliver's advice and say, you know what, this has got to be simple, it's got to be applicable, and it's got to be something that changes how we do this. And so what I'd like to do in the about 14 minutes we have left together is talk about, very simply, um, two rules for successful parenting. And I added under there a subline, or grandparenting, or anting, or uncling, or just playing being good with kids. How do we do this well? I don't know where um, I heard this, or actually I know where I heard it, but I don't know who I heard it from. So I can't take credit for the overall outline of this morning's uh, sermon. Uh, I was listening to the radio uh, a couple of months ago, and I heard, um, I heard a uh, 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 just a, one of those five-minute uh, advice on parenting. And the guy said uh, two things. Teach your kids right and wrong, and secondly, teach them unconditional love. Love them unconditionally. And so really, that's what we want to talk about this morning. In parenting, good parenting is really about teaching our kids right and wrong and loving them unconditionally. So I'm going to talk real quickly about how do we teach our kids right from wrong, and then I'm going to give, uh, Pastor Tim's going to talk about uh, loving our kids unconditionally. I think the foundation of teaching our kids right and wrong uh, is found in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, Moses is, is kind of giving his farewell address to the people of Israel. That's pretty much the whole book of Deuteronomy. And in chapter 6, uh, he, he kind of gives like this just incredibly, incredible statement that has become uh, so important to generation after generation. He says this, uh, starting in verse 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're uh, going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. A couple things there that jump out to me um, that just uh, really is the foundation of as followers of Jesus, how do we influence children? But most importantly, how do we as parents influence children? And that is in the teaching of right and wrong. But notice where Moses starts when he gives this instruction. He starts with really the first and foremost thing uh, that Jan and Chet talked about is teaching them to love Jesus. Jan said, give them Jesus. Moses, as he's talking about this, he's talking about passing on from generation to generation what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He says, first and foremost, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Good parenting starts with good parents who love Jesus with everything in them. As a parent, the best thing you can give your kids is your love for Jesus and teaching them to love Jesus, instilling them in them a passion for Jesus. Parenting well, uh, teaching them to love Jesus is not creating a better list of do's and don'ts. 
Most of us grew up with a really long list of do's and don'ts. I grew up in a household that had a huge list of do's and don'ts. My, uh, my church that I grew up in had just an incredible list of do's and don'ts. My life was transformed when I learned to fall in love with Jesus, not to follow a list of rules. And if we can do anything as parents, as we can do anything as grandparents, aunts, uncles, whatever, is teach our children, teach young children what it means to love Jesus. I love the book of Hosea. We went through it a couple years ago in one of our series. And in Hosea, God straight out says, I'm not looking for you to follow all the rules. What I'm looking for you to do is to love me obedience, learning, knowing, doing right and wrong comes not from the list of rules, but it flows out of a genuine love for the Lord and wanting to honor Him. Secondly, Moses says, teach them the Word. As we are instilling a love for the Lord into our children, as we're passing that along to them, we do that through making the Word part of our lives. First of all, it has to be a part of your life. You as parents have to be in the Word, as grandparents in the Word, and let it flow out of your life. Not using Scripture as a weapon. I mean, how, how many of us have had that happen? You know, um, the Bible says, obey your parents, therefore you must do what I tell you to do. God never intended his word to be a weapon that we could beat each other up with, that we could use as a good zinger when we need something to go our way. When the word is part of our lives, when we are engrossed in it, when we're washed in it, when we're covered by it, it flows out of us. We teach our children, we invest in our kids the word of God. Earlier on, um, we heard from Ephesians chapter 6. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. That partly happens when we, when, we, when we wield the word of God as a weapon against our children. But it says, rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. We've got to be teaching. We invest in our kids the word of God. And I think probably the most important thing, Joshua chapter 4, is modeling for our children the things that we're talking to them about, the things we're teaching them, the things we're instructing them in. As they came out of the, across the Jordan River, God commanded Joshua to go back in and, and grab 12 stones and bring them out and set up an altar. It became a physical representation, a visual representation of what had happened. And I think in our very lives, we don't have these kind of same visual representations. We don't have these big monuments. But I think our lives as parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles need to be a physical representation of, of all that God is and all that he does. I love what Gary Confalone said to me. Uh, I had talked to him and, and, and just said, you know, Gary, talk to me about parenting. And he said, the, the, the thing I would say about parenting is this. Parenting is more caught than it is taught. In other words, your children and your grandchildren are watching. You can you can tell, you can speak till you're blue in the face. If you're not living it, neither will they. They will observe everything you do. I love to spend time in the Word. I love to read my Bible. That did not come from anybody telling me I had to do that. That did not come from any rule anywhere that said you should read your Bible. Really, where I got a desire to read my Bible was from the time I was about 12 years old. I would come up the steps every morning to get in the shower to go to school, and I would turn the corner, and sitting in the same chair every day with his Bible open on his lap was my dad. And so when my dad talks to me about the importance of reading his word, or reading God's word, 
that's not something that he's making up. It's not a good thought that he had somewhere. It's something he lived out. And as we teach our kids right from wrong, it is so vital that we are living out the things we're teaching. But we don't just teach our kids right from wrong. That is so very important. It's a huge part of parenting. But another huge part of parenting is loving kids unconditionally. Let me give Tim some time to to share some thoughts on loving kids unconditionally. I think that we can all agree that none of us have perfect children. Is that true? Oh yeah, okay. If you're sitting there with your parents today, you're probably nudging them saying, okay, mom and dad, fess up. No one's perfect, and that's the reality. And so we don't expect our children to be perfect. We have to expect that our kids are going to make mistakes. But how do we love our kids without condition? Well, we accept that they're human like we are and imperfect because of the fall back in the garden. But we need to model that love to our kids, as was spoken earlier today. First of all, we need to tell our kids that we love them. We tell them constantly. We need to tell them over and over again. We need to tell them that when they are making good choices. We need to tell them that we love them when they're making poor choices. We've always told our kids that, that we love them and adore them. And, and when Lindsay was about eight years old or something, I asked her, how do you know that mom and I love you? And she said to me, well, you tell us, Daddy. You tell us that you love us. I'm like, good, remember that. And it's true, we do tell them, but we need to show them that we love them as well. Saying those words isn't just enough. So when, when our children were young, uh, we used to put them in timeout when they were disobedient. And one of our children, I won't say which one, uh, disliked them more than others. And would sit on the step. We always put our children on the steps going up to the bedrooms and, and for timeout and would cry and sob and say, I'm sorry, Daddy. I'm sorry, Daddy. And it was my practice to go and sit on that step alongside of that child and our children, put my arm around them, and I say, I know you're sorry, and I love you, but what you did was wrong, and we're going to work through this together. That kind of tells them, not just telling them that we love them, but shows them that we love them. And we also need to live love, as I think Mike just said that. We need to live in, in such a way that separates the action of that child from the disobedience or the sin and from who that child actually is. So tell her that you don't expect her to be perfect. Let your child know that no matter what they do or don't do, it's not going to change the fact that you still love them. There are some practical ways that we can do that. Uh, we care for our children. We care for them physically by providing food and shelter and clothing for them. But we also need to provide for their emotional needs. We do need to teach them what's acceptable and what is unacceptable according to God's rule and God's law and his word. And we also need to encourage them to always do the right thing. But allow your kids to make mistakes. And don't be surprised when they do. But when they do, walk alongside of them through that mistake. And when they repent, let them know that you appreciate that. And you respect their decision. But then help them also to develop a plan to be victorious the next time over that particular issue. And always encourage them to seek God for his guidance. And Chet and Jan, I mean, like I said, Mike stated, you, you kind of said what we were going to say. But we need to pray over our children constantly. That is such an important part of showing them the love that we have for them unconditionally. We need to pray wisdom over our children. We need to pray vision over our children and let them know that God has a plan for their lives as, as a, an apostle, as a prophet, as an evangelist, as a shepherd, as a teacher in the kingdom of God. We need to cast that vision for them. And when they do things that we want to lash out against, we need to take a step back and resist lashing out of them, even though we may be justified in what they did. And when we mess up, we need to apologize to them. We need to model that forgiveness to them as well and ask them for their forgiveness. So what unconditionally loving our kids doesn't mean is that we accept the sin that is in their lives as if it doesn't matter, because it does matter. It matters so much that Jesus died for that sin. So that is a serious thing. As children grow, you know, they, they like to test the waters, and they step out a little bit, and sometimes they don't always follow our instruction or our guidance. 
Sometimes they're obstinate. Sometimes they can be defiant and say some really cruel things to us. But again, we need to separate that from the person of that child. As humans, we don't like being told what to do. We like to go our own way. We don't like people telling us how to live. But we also need to teach our children that consequences or choices have consequences. So if you choose well, those consequences are going to be good. If you choose poorly, those consequences are going to have bad results. And I tell our teenagers all the time that whatever decision they, they make, they need to decide that they're ready to live with those consequences. So be ready for that. I read a book a number of years ago called Come Back Barbara, and it's a story of a, a pastor who, who is, uh, or was down in Jenkintown and his daughter. His daughter was fourth of five children. When she turned 18, she told her parents she no longer wanted to live by their rules. She no longer wanted to live by their morals. And she decided that she was not going to live the Christian life, which broke their heart. They were upset, of course, obviously. But they let her go. They loved her through that time. And this book is a story of that healing in their life because of the choices that they made to love this daughter unconditionally. They respected her decision as an 18-year-old adult to make her own decisions, but the story is one of repentance and deliverance from this life of destruction that Barbara was on. And the things that Barbara's parents did were simple. They prayed constantly for her. They accepted her and respected her right to make those decisions. They didn't accept the sin in her life, but they chose to love her in spite of that sin. And, very importantly, they always let her know that she could always return, that she could always come back at any time. So we always need to give our kids that assurance that their actions don't determine the love that we have for them. And we need to let them know that no matter what they do, they can always come back. That's unconditional love. And we see God acting that way with the Israelites, don't we? We had to let them go for a period of time in their lives. But he always told them, drawing them back, drawing them back in loving kindness, saying, I've got a better plan for you. I know it's not easy, unconditional love, but it takes determination and, and patience and, and um, prayer and trust. But God tells us, the prophet Jeremiah, that I have loved you with an everlasting love that doesn't change. And that should be our motto as well, our mantra. We love you no matter what you do, no matter where you are, no matter where you go. We love you. Keep that in mind. God's love for us is unconditional, and our love for our children needs to be unconditional as well. And if we believe that we are created in the image of God, then we believe that we have that capacity. Maybe not easily, but we have it. When your kids disappoint you, you still have the charge to love them. Scriptures clearly teach us that children are a gift from the Lord. Even when they disappoint us, we love them. Thanks, Tim. So two simple rules in parenting. You know, the reality is we can do everything right and our kids still have the ability to make choices. And sometimes those choices have minor consequences and a uh, minor direction where they may walk away from the Lord, as Tim talked about Barbara, and other times they're major and they're long-standing. But I think a key principle for us as we walk away from this place in parenting, understanding those two rules of parenting, teach our kids right and wrong, love our kids unconditionally. Key principle, though, is this. Even when they fail at rule number one, make sure they know rule number two. Even when they let you down, even when they make mistakes, even when they make a poor choice, make sure they know you love them unconditionally. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love. I love that in Scripture you refer to yourself as Father. As a parent, I think there's huge implications there, God, of the reality that so often we make poor choices. We walk away from you. We let you down. But God, your love for us is unconditional. God, I pray for each family represented in this room that, God, you would give wisdom to parents, help them to love their kids unconditionally. God, may they model for them. May they model for them well their love for you. And God, I pray that you would transform families for your honor and glory. 
transform individuals in this room, make them good parents, good grandparents, good aunts and uncles, good babysitters, good whatever role it is that they are in, that they have influence over the lives of children. Help us to love and help us to live out, to model what it means to be a follower of Jesus who loves you with everything in us. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name. Sing maybe one verse for a closing hymn. Thanks. Number 294, There's Not a Friend. Number 294, let's stand to sing, and following our singing, we'll receive the benediction. Let's, let's sing verse 1. Can we do that, Rich? Just verse 1. Here we go. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. Could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Father, thank you that you know all about our struggles. And God, we confess that parenting sometimes is a gigantic struggle. It is not easy helping a baby to become a responsible adult. Helping somebody who is like us, who we recognize is broken and has a tendency to run away from you, not just wander from you. God, teach them how to love you and bring glory to you. Father, thank you for each family in this room, each parent, each child. And we pray, oh God, that you would that you would help us to understand the depths of your love and to model that to those we come in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. Have a happy Mother's Day.